Hi, how's everyone doing today? Yeah. Hey. Great. So, what are we here for? We are here. What are, why are we? Oh, no, we're here because we love Mark Davis. And uh, so, we wrote a book about him. Actually, he kind of wrote it himself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this, is, um, this has been this big labor of love for Pete and I uh, for the past almost five years, uh, working on lunch breaks and train rides and weekends. And uh, this is giant book that is basically Mark's second career uh, at Walt Disney Imagineering, designing some of the most iconic theme park attractions, I think you could say, anywhere in the world, right? I mean, we don't have to introduce to you uh, the fact that Mark was uh, one of the nine old men, one of the great animators at Disney, right. but we, just to say that this is all covered in the book, we kind of start with uh, a very brief overview of the amazing work he did in uh, feature animation, and then covering the transition to his work at uh, WED. So, yeah. And then every single attraction that he worked on is covered in the book, amazing drawings. Mm. I also want to just as a preamble say the book is um, basically uh, Mark's own words. Uh, Chris was able to transcribe countless interviews and, and uh, lectures that Mark did. So you'll see alongside of his artwork, Mark talking about why he made specific choices, why he did uh, these changes and the color and the kind of materials he w w used and the process. And so it's really like stepping into a time machine yeah. and sitting next to Mark and getting to watch him work. Yeah, that was the, the thing we wanted to help get across is like being with Mark. So Pete and I have this uh, long history with Mark and Alice Davis. Uh, when we were both students in the 90s uh, going to uh, California Institute of the Arts, uh, we were both lucky enough to visit with and strike up a relationship with uh, Mark and Alice Davis. Um, and it was great because, you know, Pete was able to ask uh, animation questions and I was able to ask theme park design questions. And so really it's turned into this um, amazing two volume set. Uh, it's called Mark Davis in his own words, Imagineering the Disney theme parks. And uh, we couldn't be happier with how it turned out. It really is exhaustive. Right. Yeah. We had an amazing team, which we'll happily give plenty of credit to. Yeah. So uh, several years ago, uh, Pete and I called Alice Davis up and, and to talk to her about this idea for this coffee table book. And uh, so this is Pete and I at Alice's house uh, in Los Angeles and showing her kind of the proofs of what we wanted to do. And she really turned over the entire house to us. It was really uh, generous of her. And along the way, we found some amazing discoveries, uh, personal photos of them together. Uh, these are photos that uh, Mark took when he and Alice first started dating. <laughs> There's even a uh, Mark Davis selfie <laughs> mixed in in those. May, or not, may not have been intentional, but... And, you know, it was funny because uh, we found in like old, you know, in old drawers and old boxes and in, in, particularly in this one box that was underneath Mark's desk uh, in his, uh, his drawing room, uh, we found these incredible photos. Uh, this, is, this is right when Mark first started as an animator at the uh, Walt Disney Studios in 1937 and he's animating on actually the uh, prints in Snow White here. And then next to that looks like uh, from the fair, 64 World's Fair, or is that? No, actually, these are all from 37. These oh, are all from Hyperion. Okay, so yeah, yeah, that's, from yeah. Okay. that's Walt uh, in the middle there. And then um, I believe that's Grim Natwick he's oh, posing yeah. with on the right. Yeah, because he was assistant to Grim, so. Right, right. One of the biggest things, people keep asking us, like, what is, what is the thing that surprised you about this book? And one of the things that surprised me was Mark actually did designs. I thought he'd started in the 60s, but he actually did designs for Disneyland opening year. Uh, this is Mark's sketch for the Golden Horseshoe uh, Oleo, which is the backdrop that goes down. So he did that while he was working, and you can see he's working uh, at his desk uh, in, in the Walt Disney Studios, which he, sh he kind of shared an adjoining office with Milt Call, right? He and Milt were uh, best, best buds, I think both because they respected each other. Um, there were such a high level of perfectionism between the two of them that they would often kind of sneer at uh, other artists' abilities and yet they both respected each other and so uh, mm. it's a mutual admiration society. I think they literally wrote uh, little postcards to each other about <laughs> that, so. There, there's a gag drawing between uh, uh, Milt and Mark in the book that's pretty funny. Uh, and then Mark also took these photos again. This is about a week and a half before opening Disneyland. And looks ready to open. Coming off right, this, this gives me a heart attack looking at these yeah. photos. <laughs> 
Uh, so it's pretty interesting. So Mark was involved early on with it. I didn't really realize that. So uh, the next slide is uh, one of Mark and Alice Davis's house, and it's absolutely incredible. I mean, me as a student going over there for the first time, it's filled with Mark's original artwork, Mary Blair's, Papua New Guinea artifacts, jaw-dropping. I don't know what you thought when you first Yeah, it was, I mean, actually we, we uh, were at their house uh, as we were starting to work on uh, the film Up that I directed in, and we used a lot of things that we noticed around the house that the sense that there's like no square inch of wall space available because everything has a memory attached to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, was, it was fascinating. Mm. All right, so let's jump into Mark's theme park design, uh, the Jungle Cruise, which is uh, amazing. Uh, Mark actually worked on it. Walt uh, called him in uh, early on uh, and said, asked him to go down and take a look at things. Uh, this is Mark in his office at uh, Walt Disney Imagineering, which used to be called WED Enterprises. And so here Mark is working uh, later in the 70s on some Jungle Cruise artwork. But I thought it would be fun uh, to go in and take a look at the uh, design of the elephants in the Jungle Cruise. So this is kind of a beautiful overview that Mark did. And again, the design of these elephants is really great because it's based in actual anatomy, but Mark actually took it a step further and added a slight caricature, little smiles you can notice on these elephants. And uh, for me, that's the quintessential Disney touch. It's maybe not something that you necessarily notice right away, uh, but there's that sense of Disney charm to these elephants, especially the baby elephants. And uh, here's a photo of Walt backstage at Disneyland uh, with the mother elephant. And you can, again, you can see really clearly that little smile, that kind of smirk that, that Mark has given into this great sculpture by Blaine Gibson. And uh, it's just part of the Disney charm. So I thought it would be fun in the research for this process we found um, some videotapes of Mark coming to Walt Disney Imagineering in the 70s and giving design lectures. So let's hear from Mark Davis himself right now about what he has to say about the design of the elephants. Next thing I worked on was the Jungle River ride. I think, well, after Lincoln and a few other things in between, uh, I did some work on uh, uh, Nature's Wonderland. I did some uh, kind of a rehab on the um, sub ride and so on. But this was really kind of the first big kind of job of love. So anyway, did the elephant pool. And these are little explorations of things, again, something that an elephant, uh, our elephants could do that you wouldn't see with a real elephant. And matter of fact, I remember somebody went through there one day and a couple of elderly ladies said, well, you can, t you can tell me those big elephants aren't real, but those little elephants are real. But we had them doing things, you know, like two sprays out of the trunk and so forth and so on. Anyway, this was a, a very interesting thing that happened because I, designed this pool, Blaine Gibson did some magnificent uh, uh, sculptors, maquettes of these things, we put it all together. And then one day we went down there to see the thing, and God, I took a look at this, and there were so many elephants in that pool, and I thought, because again, knowing Walt Disney, and, and he was such a bear on how do you stage something, and things being staged right, things telling their story properly. And the first thing I said to him, I said, well, there's one thing uh, you're probably not going to like, Paul, I said, is that is that nobody can go through here and see all these elephants at one time. He says, and this, again, is how, you, how things begin to happen. He said, God, that's great. He says, so the next time they come through, they'll see something they didn't the second time. So the cool thing for you guys is, obviously, this is not in the book, the video. Yeah. So this is something that most people don't get to see. Yeah, and I, I just think hearing directly from Mark himself talking about his design theories is like gold to me. So uh, these are kind of cool. So these are, um, we're going to get nerdy on some of this. You guys okay with getting nerdy on some of this stuff? <laughs> uh, someone's not over there. Oh, someone's not. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so these are some of Mark's designs for Florida's version of the Jungle Cruise at Walt Disney World. And uh, I really love the design of these uh, canoes, but I also really like the little handwritten notes. These are notes to Waithel Rogers, who was working in the field and, do, and uh, basically direction for him when Mark couldn't be there in terms of staging and how he wanted things laid out. 
Also, Mark, uh, as usual, came up with a slew of different ideas uh, that we didn't actually do. And these gags uh, for the Jungle Cruise are just as strong as, as the ones that are in there today. Certainly could put them back and you would feel like he designed them in the 60s. This is Mark's design for a um, sacred elephant graveyard uh, in Florida that they didn't do. And then it's fun to see some photos of Mark at work. So this is the model for Florida's Jungle Cruise. He's there with Bill Justice. And the, uh, the weird little doctor's kind of looking contraption Mark's looking into, this is something that uh, Waithel Rogers, I believe, developed. It allows you to look in this little glass at the top, and you get the guest eye view in a small model so you can really work on your staging and you see feel what... feel like you're walking through it. That's right. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Cool. And this is really interesting. So this is, this is something that Mark tried to put into Florida's Jungle Cruise. It is a man-eating plant. And uh, he said, you know, this thing would have burped and belched as you went by. And he said, and as I say, it was way before Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, interestingly enough to discover, I just thought this was another idea that didn't get very far. But they actually uh, did put it in the model. Uh, so these are photos of the Jungle Cruise from Florida. And if you zoom in, you can see there's a little man-eating plant uh, <laughs> right there with human skulls. And even going uh, further, you look into the documentation, the uh, worksheet of production, you can see that the man-eating plant was slated for production. Never seen the sculpture of it, but it was going to happen. At some point, uh, the man-eating plant went away, and so Mark designed these giant frogs from South America in their place. So the giant frogs actually were uh, designed and put in the Jungle Cruise in Florida. Uh, these are figure finishing documentations of the frogs, and I've heard that they lasted about a year or so, and for some reason someone removed them, but they forgot to turn the tape recording of the frogs uh, uh, barking and ribbiting. Uh, so for years, you went by this scene in the Jungle Cruise in Florida, and you're this ribbit, ribbit, and you didn't know where it was coming from. <laughs> Here's Mark uh, in the trough uh, in Anaheim supervising work. So Mark was extremely hands-on in what he did, and especially with uh, Anaheim being so close to where he lived in Los Angeles, when they did different rehabs or work on the, on the attractions, he was able to come down and supervise. Uh, so we're going to play a little video. This is really rare footage of Mark actually inspecting uh, the 1970s rehab of Anaheim's Jungle Cruise. Okay. Now, there's no sound on this, so I, I put some of the jungle sound effects behind it. <laughs> but behind him is Fred Jerger and Waithel Rogers, who are two really key influential Imagineers working with him. And, I, boy, I want to hire a lip reader to see what Mark is uh, saying to them at this point, because I'd, I'd love <laughs> to hear what he's saying. To me, this is absolutely gold because it's the master of staging and design in his, in, in his environment <laughs> walking through. And I can just almost picture him going, well, this is poor staging, as I say. Yeah. <laughs> and move this here and there, that, that, that doesn't go there. Put that there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I was a fly on the wall there. Really, really cool stuff. So again, obviously, that's not in the book. OK, so a little nerdy history. Um, throughout the 1950s, uh, Walt Disney Imagineering, which again was known as Wet Enterprises in those days, was all based at the Walt Disney Studios. And he had all the Imagineers and little offices and hidey holes and spread throughout the campus. And so they needed to move. And so they decided to move down the road to Glendale. And they moved into this building. It's called the 800 Sonora Building. And we still have it at Walt Disney Imagineering to this day. Um, and it it had this really interesting peaked roof to it, and they all called it the uh, Pancake House because they thought it looked like an IHOP. Yeah. Also, Alice Davis said, you know, it said Wed Enterprises on the outside of the building, and she said people kept calling and saying, is this a wedding shop? You know, can I set up my, my yeah. bridal registry here? So what was going on inside the building? Well, this is what was going on inside this little tiny building. Walt Disney and his team of Imagineers were designing everything for the Jungle Cruise in the 60s, Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room, all four 1964 New York World Fair shows, and early Pirates of the Caribbean. And it was a skeleton crew of like 20 some people in this small building designing all those shows. This is uh, Harriet Burns and uh, Joyce Carlson doing figure finishing on the Tiki Room Birds. And they had, everyone had their offices along the front on um, Grand Central and Sonora, which is where the building is still today. And uh, then all the artists in the back, they had a little model shop and they did figure finishing. So let's take a look at some of Mark's designs for the Enchanted Tiki Room. These are so appealing. I, again, 
Mark based everything in real anatomy because Walt Disney said he wanted, quote, real birds, but you can see he's added that Disney touch, that little sense of whimsy to them. And it wasn't the first thing out. You know, they did a bunch of different studies and designs, um, both in a <clears throat> more realistic direction, but also in a more caricatured cartoon version, mm -hmm. uh, especially like Raleigh Crump's designs are very cartooned. Right. Um, some of those are included. Yeah. I love, I love these drawings too. I love those little caiques up in the right hand corner. They're super cute, super appealing. So as Pete alluded to, Mark did try some really wacky tiki birds. These are very strange. Um, and that was evidently not what Walt Disney was looking for, but they're, they're fun designs. And I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you do at Pixar, right? Is really explore every facet. Yeah, and I love like his, those just the, the drawings of the birds of varying sizes di diminishing to the larger bells, you know, just such great visual rich ideas. Really uh, fun stuff. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's go back to Mark and hear what he has to say about uh, designing on the Enchanted Tiki Room. So the thing was that uh, we began to, uh, or at least I began to form a kind of my own philosophy of what an audio animatronic show was in a park such as Disneyland or Disney World, or the same would be in Tokyo. One thing, nobody wants to stay in one attraction very long. And uh, not staying in one attraction very long, you want to give um, a lot of show in a very short space of time. But what we really found, what I found here, was this show is built of a series of surprises. You do not know what's going to happen. You go in there and there's some birds, and I would say you can certainly assume that the birds are going to uh, come to life. It's pretty obvious that they would. And uh, they go through their little bit and uh, and then things begin to happen. The, the fountain comes to life and uh, uh, and it moves to music. The lighting is so important in this. And uh, I may not have the things in, in exact order, but when these uh, uh, big bowls that hold the flowers come down and the flowers begin to sing and then the, the kind of key flowers come up and uh, and sing solo again this is it's a surprise it's what you did not expect to see and uh, and then finally the ceiling opens up and this bird mobile comes down and uh, and then finally the whole room comes to life now this is to me uh, this is the most exciting part of the show is when this, I guess it's the Hawaiian war dance, comes on and, and black the room on and light, you know, and lightning flashes. And then even the wall decorations come to life. The, uh, the poles that uh, are holding up the building come to life. And I think this is uh, really the extraordinary thing. Now this was, this was the first sketch I think I did when we were only going to have maybe two heads on these. Then we finally ended up with uh, three heads, and this was this was a, a more or less a finished sketch that I did. And these are based on they're based on New Guinea art. Uh, the only thing is that I have taken a lot of liberties with it. It's it's so cool to see that discovery. You know, yeah. that's uh, portrayed in the book too. Of, this is the first time they're doing this stuff and they're figuring out how it works, how it communicates to people. It's amazing to me, yeah. These, these pencil sketches that he does that we were lucky to have him show to us and Alice Davis was so generous to let us use for the book, um, really show his thought process and his working process. And as a designer, that's gold to me. I, I love to see how he came up with ideas and think about things. So, and the book is, is full of these uh, little sketches and just mm -hmm. great, well, and often we've been able to put the sketches next to more fin finished artwork, which then goes to uh, what's actually in the attraction and just watch that ev evolution is, yeah. is really fun. The idea is to kind of put yourself uh, in Mark's brain and how he came up with these things, which is, uh, these are iconic theme park attractions. Uh, so these are his designs for the talking tiki poles. And I like on the backside, they've got uh, little behinds uh, sticking out of them, <laughs> which is actually in the sculpt at the tiki room, if you can <laughs> sneak back there and take a look. Uh, and then this is how they ended up uh, installing them. They're so charming and colorful. And I love that shot of Walt. I guess my mom can attest I, I did that as a kid like put my mouth in the mm -hmm. in the in the put, your hand or in put the my mouth. finger in the mouth on my yeah. way out of the, yeah it's 
Anyway, uh, one thing we really wanted to talk about with this book project that we absolutely could not have done uh, without the help of Vanessa Hunt and Mike Jusco and Denise Brown at the Walt Disney uh, Imagineering Art Collections. The art collection there, they have over 160,000 pieces of artwork and a very small staff to take care of all of that. But this is the bedrock of Walt Disney's Imagineering design. So they take care of all of Mark's uh, final artwork and every other Imagineering artist along the way. So. In this project, you know, there are these massive uh, file drawers that they pull out where all the original artwork is, very carefully handle it, and they take it, and they, uh, they uh, photograph this. And then Vanessa and her team, they re-photographed over 700 pieces of artwork for this book to get the color the most true and accurate that it's ever been. They even went back and uh, took out some of the original surviving maquettes. Uh, this is from uh, Nature's Wonderland and matched up the staging with uh, Mark's artwork so we could have nice new colorful pictures of it for the book. So getting back into Mark's designs, um, Mark designed on all four shows for the 1964 New York World's Fair. This is uh, for the Ford Magic Skyway. That's an attraction you may not know about, but it's where the dinosaurs and the train ride at Disneyland come from. He also worked on uh, Carousel of Progress and the Mr. Lincoln Show. But one of the most amazing things he worked on with a really fast time frame was the It's a Small World attraction for the 1964 New York World's Fair. So here's uh, Walt Disney with uh, Dick Irvine, the gentleman who was running Imagineering at the time, and they're looking over the model for Small World. And you can see that's, that's their whole cafeteria back there, which consisted <laughs> of a break room and a few vending machines. And these are photos, by the way, that were uh, unearthed by Chris uh, uh, that have never been published. So it's very candid. Uh, working photos, which are fascinating. Yeah, they're, uh, they're kind of, we're going to see a few more in a second. Cool. Uh, here's Mark and Walt and Mary Blair uh, at the studio where they had the model set up. And I just, I just love the camaraderie there. I mean, look at Mark. He looks so, so happy with the designs he did. So uh, going back to the beginning of It's a Small World, when Walt came to the team and talked to them about it, uh, originally, before Mary Blair was even involved, uh, they tried to do kind of a Mary Blair-type style for it. And you can, you can see this in Mark's drawings. He's trying to do a, a whimsical, uh, childlike sort of a thing. And uh, it's charming and cute. But Walt wasn't necessarily 100% satisfied with it. Um, and then when you get into, make, they started making some little rough temporary models for it. So Claude Coates worked on this with Mark briefly for a time. And they start making these little models that are very stylized. Uh, Mark even did these little small color studies and sketches. So you can see he's trying to do something in the vein of, of how Mary would do it. We just turned up these little rough sketches that Mark did too on these sonographer pads. So they're really small little drawings and kind of exploring ideas. I like these goofy Christmas trees with the, yeah. <laughs> the smiles there. There's dozens and dozens of these too, so. And it's interesting to see the progression, like you start to see things that actually make it into the final yeah. show, uh, like the, um, uh, the dancing leprechaun and the mm -hmm. singing geese. So there are these little test models, which again are kind of evocative, but not the final thing. Uh, so basically, Mary Blair was still living in New York at this time, and Walt just called her in and said, will you come in and work on this? So Mary actually did it from New York and like did her artwork at home and mailed them out, and then occasionally she'd fly out for business trips. Yeah, she was the only artist that I'm aware of that uh, was freelance. Mm. Everybody else was in, in, in studio. And her design is just absolutely incredible, the colors. I mean, Mark said, Mary, you know, uh, Matisse couldn't hold a candle to, to Mary's color stylings. And boy, she sure is one of the most amazing artists that ever worked for Walt yeah. Disney Imagineering. So yeah, absolutely. Just a titan of imaginary. Uh, so back to what Pete was saying before about some of these photos we found at the Library of Congress. We love these. This is an 800 Sonora, and um, it's out in the back in the model shop, which was kind of a tin shed. And uh, Mark is actually pitching his ideas for the toys to Walt Disney. And we love these because they're not staged photos. They're actually at work uh, trying to convince Walt. So these, I mean, these are titans of Imagineering. There's uh, Claude Coates and Rolly Crump and Yale Gracie and Blaine Gibson. Um, everyone is there. Here's uh, Roger Brogy and uh, Dick uh, Nunes, I believe, uh, looking a little uh, stressed out. <laughs> Like, how are we going to do this? And then they've got all of Mary Blair's artwork up on the wall as an inspiration. So I, I can't imagine what it would have been like to be there in the 1960s. Mm. 
It was a great shot of Walt with the, the model, too. So the model was, was really amazing because, of course, Mary Blair was setting the color styling and the set design, but Mark was doing all of the character design. And, uh, you know, all the posing, all the animation, all that, Mark was responsible for all that. So he was hugely involved in the design of this. It really was a great collaboration between him and Mary Blair and lots of other people, too. But I would say those are the two key artists who really set the style for this show. Uh, this is really fun. We found this um, in the flat files. This is a pencil sketch by Mary Blair uh, of the, I believe it's one of the European seasons. I think that's the Eiffel Tower in the middle. Mm. And there was a piece of vellum attached to the front and it had this kind of spidery handwriting on it. Well, that's Mary's handwriting. And when you darken it up in Photoshop, you can see those are notes from Mary to Mark about staging and color and design and, and how, how we do this. So they really worked together. And not only were uh, they work colleagues, but they were actually good friends. Uh, these are some photos that Mark had taken of um, Mary Blair and Claude and Evie Coates and Glendra von Kestrel. And they're all having a Christmas party at Mark and Alice Davis's house. <laughs> And one of the great things was Alice Davis, who's an amazing designer in her own right. Uh, she was hired by Walt Disney to do the costume design, uh, partially because Mary Blair encouraged it, and she and Mary were really good friends. And boy, the designs that um, uh, Alice Davis did for the, uh, the doll's costumes, absolutely fantastic, really cool. So there's a little bit in the book on Alice as well. And, and how they met Walt in the restaurant. Oh, that's right, yeah. They, yeah they, Mark and Alice met uh, Walt Disney one night at the Tam O'Shanter restaurant um, in Los Angeles here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Tam O'Shanter> fans. <laughs> wow. And uh, Walt said, oh, this is uh, Mrs. Davis. Well, you'll come work for me someday. And, and she did. Yeah. She designed that and the costumes for Pirates of the Caribbean. So Alice Davis is phenomenal. We, we love her so much. Yeah. Here's Alice's design for uh, the, I believe it's a Hungarian uh, girl. And she told us that, um, she asked Walt, she said, well, what's my budget for these costumes? And she said, Walt's eyebrow cocked up and he said, I want you to design these as the most beautiful costumes that any little girl in the world would love to play with. So she did. This is kind of fun. There's no audio to this uh, film footage, but this is uh, kind of rare backstage footage. I just wanted to show Mary in her environment. This is uh, Mary with Rolly Crump. There they are. They're looking at the small world model. This is actually set up on a sound stage at the studio to make it look like uh, wet enterprises. <laughs> very, very cute stuff. <laughs> and then here they are in production on the uh, costumes. And again, the design that Alice did is just absolutely phenomenal on these. Next time you go through the attraction, take a look. It's, it's amazing. So these are some of the soundstage mock-ups that they did. They actually designed all the sets for It's a Small World very quickly. And a company called Grosh Studios here in Los Angeles built all the sets. And they to be one of the guys pushing these right? along. <laughs> Yeah, so they set it all up on one of the sound stages, and then they put the boat up on casters, and they pushed Walt and Mary Blair and Mark Davis and everyone through so they could get an idea like what the guests would see as they rode through. It's a great way to do it. I think yeah. it's smart. All right, let's talk about uh, one of the best attractions of all time, Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. Mark's designs are so key and influential for this show. Now, I, I think a lot of people may have seen this photo before, but this is actually part of our model shop at 1401 Flower Street. And it's kind of neat to take these pictures and go stand in the same locations oh, yeah. where they shot these. Like some of the airlines on the wall, you can still see them in the same place. <laughs> and in our research for this book, um, we were going through Mark's office and in his desk drawer, there was this kind of little legal pad. And what this is, is these are Mark's handwritten first notes for Pirates of the Caribbean when it was a wax museum walkthrough. And this is some of his research. So you see the first time you see Dead Men Tell No Tales in it. He explored for a little bit uh, doing this almost like a historical, an accurate, historically accurate. Yeah, place. yeah. He talked about how do I approach something like this? And he thought, well, let's give some faces and personalities to these actual historical figures. That would be a good way to start. This is Mark's overview of the Pirate's Wax Museum as it first was going to be seen. And then he did a revision on it a little bit later. And uh, for me, getting really nerdy, I think it's really fun to figure out like what these scenes would have been like. Uh, they're quite small, but if you know some of the finished artwork Mark did, you can see they match up. So that uh, little, um, little room in the center there, I believe that that is actually this artwork here. 
where the pirates are opening a treasure chest. And another thing that Mark did in the Wax Museum pirate show, uh, he was a real believer in strong female protagonists. So uh, this is Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, and they were uh, two uh, bloodthirsty pirates themselves. And I love these drawings because all the guys are getting like paltry little coins and they're taking the lion's share. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another one of Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed counting their treasure. And when I was looking at this, I, I've been seeing this since I was a little kid, and it didn't occur to me until we got into it. But uh, I thought, wait a minute, those skeletons look very similar to me. And if you look at them, when it came time to do the skeletons for the cave scenes, uh, Mark reused his, uh, his poses for these gags. So a lot of times when Mark would design something and it wouldn't be used, he would repurpose things later on. These are some of his rough sketches of uh, different personalities for the pirates. Such a great balance of caricature and, and uh, believability, realism. And I think that was him and his partnership with Blaine. And you'll see in the book some of the uh, less successful uh, par uh, interpretations, like in the, um, um, the caveman uh, ride for uh, Ford. Yes. They went a little too cartoon. Walt didn't really appreciate that. Right. And so this was always a balance back and forth of how much sort of believability or realism do you want in there? Right, yeah, I think uh, they really nailed it with the collaboration between yeah. uh, Mark and Blaine at a certain point. So when you go through Pirates of the Caribbean, look for that caricature. They're, again, supposed to be real pirates, but they've got that slight cartoony twist to them and it works. Uh, this is a sketch by a gentleman named Ken O'Connor, and Ken was uh, an animator at the studio. So like a lot of people who came over to WED, uh, he was assigned to Mark Davis, and this is his staging of Mark's gags. Uh, there's no less than seven Mark Davis gags shoved into this little tableau, so you can see he's trying to add all these things and make it into one big crazy scene that you would see when you walked through this thing. Oop, it's not advancing as fast as I want. There we go. And then another thing that's really fun to look at if you want to get super nerdy is before they did the big show model, they did a little smaller scale paper model. And it's neat to see because um, there's lots of Mark Davis gags that didn't make it into the final show, including this one. So when I was a little kid uh, riding through, you know, there's a section where they're bombing the fort. And you look at the fort, and it's kind of a big blank area. But you can see on the model, they actually were going to have that uh, big projected a shadow of, of that captain uh, up, you know, standing up on the pedestal there. Uh, that went by the wayside, but we do have shadows projected around that area today now when you ride through. That was part of the fun of the book is just tracking the progress of all this. Uh, yeah. Super nerdy. It evolved, yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is Bill Justice, and he's studying uh, these photos of live action that they set up at the studio. Uh, this gentleman is named uh, Ed Kemmer, and uh, he, uh, he posed for Prince Philip for Sleeping Beauty for some of the live action photos. So here he is, is posing as one of the pirates in Pirates of the Caribbean. And you can see they've got uh, Mark's artwork on that little table back there for reference. It's just reversed in the photo. Two things just to talk about here is, mm. one, uh, reading the book and, and listening to Mark's discussion about it, you realize how much of this was not, as a kid I would go through and I would imagine these characters in full uh, movement. And when you look at it, they're actually not. They're kind of in one key pose, which he called storytelling pose. And so even if the machinery broke down, you get this very clear read on what the character is doing, the reach, the stretch, or the pull, or whatever. So many of these things are just so beautifully staged by Mark. Um, this is actually um, uh, the early uh, method by which they had programmed the animation. There were these big plates uh, with scallops cut into the side. And so an animator would have to go through and basically use an X-Acto blade, cut out the notches in the side, and then a little uh, trigger would read off of that and uh, parrot that into the movement of all the different mechanisms, the wrist, the arm, the head, the eye blinks. So it was incredibly labor intensive and I can't imagine right. having to animate that way, it's crazy. That's how they did it back then. It made sense or is the only thing that worked. So these photos that we're looking at, they're actually not taken at Disneyland uh, with pirates. They're actually uh, staging photos at Walt Disney Imagineering in one of our high bays. And we were able to figure out exactly where they were by matching up all the junk in the ceiling up there. So you can match up like where things were, right? Like, this is right where they staged it, right there. 
So they actually showed this to Walt Disney before he passed away um, and again did a similar thing where they pushed him through on a boat on casters so he could see things. And here they are uh, showing that film footage that they shot just a minute ago and that's uh, Mark and Bill Justice on the left and uh, Jack Taylor operating the, uh, the projector and uh, I believe Waythel Rogers uh, sitting down there with the scalloped disc machine. It seems very similar to the way uh, computer animation works in a sense because you have to really analyze. You can't just feel your way through it. You have to analyze, okay, what's going on in the hips and then moving your way up, the neck, the head. So it really um, had to have kind of a science bent uh, to, to make this work. Mm. I love these photos too. These are photos shot up at uh, Aero Development in Mountain View, California, where they tested the drops on the boats. <laughs> when they came back from the New York World's Fair, uh, they decided they wanted to use a boat system like it's a small world, but of course Walt wanted some drops uh, in there. So that's what they're testing out here. And I absolutely love these photos. This is like Walt and his wed wrecking crew uh, going up the lift. And then here they are coming back down again. And right, and then the other cool thing was when we were going through Mark's photos, I found this photo. So that's actually a photo that Mark took at the same time. He's up there sitting behind Claude Coates. And you can see his check jacket is, you know, so like right at this moment, Mark's taking a photo too. It's pretty cool. <laughs> When it came time to do Pirates of the Caribbean for Florida, uh, Mark designed some new scenes. So this is a big end scene at the, the exit of the attraction. It's always interesting to hear his thoughts on yeah. why that was, he kind of preferred this to the Disneyland one. Yeah, he did. He thought this was a better solution. Uh, he'll talk about that in a second. I, I think the staging is really great on this too. Um, again, Mark was a master of color. He was a master of design and he really was a master of staging and the quick read. You look at this gag and it just, tells you instantly what's going on. But let's hear Mark talk about it in his own words. One thing that bothered me with the part ride here is the fact that the ride was over at the bottom of that up ramp and is over at the bottom of that up ramp. Then you have to go ratchety, ratchety, ratchety all the way to the top. Then you get a <laughs> bunch of bolts banged around there. Uh, then you wait and you wonder, uh, well, what are we going to do next, or when the hell are we going to get off of here, or what? <laughs> and it takes that, to me, that great amusement of the attraction away from it. And so when we did the Florida one, I wanted to use a, a speed ramp to get people up and unload them at the bottom. So what I did was to do that scene, which turned out pretty much like this, a big treasury, an awful lot to see. And uh, anyway, to do a, a parrot that could sing the song in its entirety here, so you could hear all the lyrics, and enough stuff to look at on the outside, and just nutty, nutty things here, <laughs> and uh, even to these figures, uh, which are inside, and the reason they're the color that they are, I want everything inside of that room there to be golden. I want that to look uh, rich, everything golden. So I didn't use any cool colors on them. I used the khakis and the yellows and the golds and uh, yellow rope and what have you. And uh, I think there's an effectiveness in that of, as I say again, it's making a complete visual statement. Something we can do uh, perhaps better than anybody else. <laughs> So, speaking of Pirates of the Caribbean, there is a huge attraction that was planned for Walt Disney World in Florida that Mark uh, really was big behind called the Western River Expedition. Yeah, it would have been probably, well, it was even bigger in scale than Pirates. Yep. Um, it would have been right in line with Pirates and Haunted Mansion in terms of the, the great staging, the immersive uh, environments, and we, got, we get uh, into this in pretty rich detail in the book. Yeah, so one of the other neat things is Mark worked with Mary Blair on this again. So this would have been another Mark Davis, Mary Blair designed attraction. Uh, like Pete said, it was similar in scope and scale to Pirates of the Caribbean. These are some color studies that Mary did on the Western River Expedition. And the colors are just breathtaking. I mean, really, really great. And you can see how they influenced Mark and his designs on this show. Uh, one of the big scenes in the Western River Expedition, you would have gone through a uh, kind of a box canyon sort of a thing. And the idea was that the sun was setting uh, as you went through. So you'd have all these cools down in the shade in the bottom section. And up at the top, the sun would be just hitting the top parts of the mesas in the buttes. So really the definition of playing your warms against your cools. 
Mark talked a lot about making this almost like a movie musical version yeah. of, uh, of the West. So it has all the sort of, I wouldn't say tropes, but ideas from classic Westerns, mm -hmm. um, but with a funny twist. This one is hilarious where the I love this. horses all have the mask. Yeah, so you know the bandits who are holding, uh, holding you up, actually the horses are actually uh, uh, I recognize that hiding horse. their faces too. Yeah. And uh, that's Dave Swinninger, and um, on uh, the right, Ken, uh, uh, Ken O'Connor, I believe. And on the left, that is uh, Fred Jerger with Mark, and they, uh, they did the model, and um, uh, Ken actually sculpted, I think, like 100-some maquettes for this. And Mark said one day they came in and someone stole, like, 50 of the maquettes or something like that. And he said, actually, we, if we could have killed him, found who did it, we would have killed him. Because yeah. he had to re-sculpt every single one of those maquettes. But it got that far to the point where you'll, you'll see in the book uh, and on here are these beautiful uh, models that they mocked up. And you could, you could, Chris has kind of recreated the entire attraction. Mm. It was more than one ride, actually. Yeah, it was. It, it was a couple things. It was a big complex known as Thunder Mesa. And uh, there were several attractions. There was the Western River Expedition. There was some sort of a mule ride on the top. And then there was a little train that went around the outside. And that little train actually turned into what became Big Thunder Mountain Railroad when, when Tony Baxter started working on it. These are really beautiful too. So these, you know, this, this uh, show model was actually lit as well. And the colors are just really, really brilliant. So uh, let's hear what Mark has to say. Let's go visit Mark in his office in the 70s talking about the Western River Expedition. <laughs> what you see here is the beginning of any idea that I do. I do an awful lot of roughs that are looking and searching for ideas. These sometimes I develop as small things, sometimes large, and the things that you'll see in a couple of moments all began this way. I feel that I want many ideas uh, done by myself to uh, be able to pick and choose. I think it's much better than just having one thing and saying that's it. I like to try every possibility that there is in a drawing or in an idea, staging the character, uh, try to intensify the humor or the drama that uh, it may have. So this is kind of, as I say, you're beginning to see the very, very beginnings of how I work. <laughs> and then this was really cool for me. This is uh, him actually drawing at his desk. And again, to see, see the master of design and staging actually creating these things, that's so cool. I don't know if you could make that out. He said, you certainly are going to have more than you need here. <laughs> so, it is the 50th anniversary of the Haunted Mansion this year. And the Haunted Mansion for me is probably my all time favorite theme park attraction. And uh, it's, it's really up there, it's incredible. So we thought it would be fun to focus in on some of Mark's designs for the Haunted Mansion when he worked on it. He wasn't the first person to work on the Haunted Mansion. Actually, that, that distinction goes to Ken Anderson and Claude Coates and some of these other people, Yale Gracie and Rolly Crump took a stab at it. But by the time he started working on it with Walt Disney, some of the first things that Mark did uh, was actually these pencil sketches, these roughs that Alice Davis very nicely let us use uh, that we found in his office. And they're kind of explorations of like what would be scary, what would be, you know, uh, kind of 1930s bedsheet type ghosts. <laughs> Quite a different feel. Yes, very different feel, but uh, when you look at his final artwork, I like to compare his final artwork with the staging in the Haunted Mansion as we know it today. And boy, it is sure close to it. It is, it is undeniable how close they followed Mark's designs. I love the party in the graveyard scene. It's unfortunate our font is not working. We had a really cool Haunted Mansion font. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, but these gags are really fun. Um, these are gags that are not in the graveyard at the Haunted Mansion, but I think they're really, uh, we could put them in today and they would work just as well as some of the other ones. Here's uh, Mark's uh, musicians in the graveyard. And again, you can see uh, by comparing the, uh, the opening uh, installation photos of them. Whoop. 
That does not want to advance. There we go. You can see how close they are to the actual uh, finished design. And I love this bit in the Haunted Mansion in the graveyard at the end. Uh, this is the uh, hearse that gets stuck in the mud and the contents have spilled out. So of course they're all having a tea party <laughs> as ghosts do. And of course the hitchhiking ghosts, those are so iconic. They've been parodied uh, so many times over the years. There we go. Uh, and again, you can see how closely they sculpted them uh, to Mark's designs, except for the ghost in the middle. Uh, the ghost in the middle, we sometimes call him Ezra, uh, but Mark actually used, um, or I'm sorry, not Mark, uh, Blaine Gibson, who sculpted this uh, figure, actually used a different face uh, for that tall ghost in the middle. So who is the most elusive ghost of all? <laughs> well, we're about to find out. And as they turned to run out of the door, another ghostly manifestation appeared and blocked their way. He was a cloaked figure with an evil, grinning face. A hat box hung from his hand. With each beat of his bride's heart, his head disappeared from his body and appeared in the hat box. How much do we love the hat box ghost? Thank you. Right? So cool. I grew up with this record. I don't know if you had it when you were a little. Thurl Raven Ravenscroft. Thurl Ravenscroft did the narration, and boy, it just added another layer to the Haunted Mansion in yeah. terms of storytelling. I wore this out. I think I had two or three copies. I, I used it in a school play oh, really? uh, in elementary school, yeah, for like the special effects. Yeah, um, the sound effects on the one side, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was so cool. Yeah. So anyway, um, Going back, uh, trying to kind of trace where Mark came up with the Hatbox Ghost. Uh, this is, I believe it's an idea for uh, one of these changing uh, paintings in the Haunted Mansion uh, called the Phantom Drummer of Tedworth. And uh, you can see the face is starting to get into that creepy, kooky 60s kind of look I associate with the Haunted Mansion. And then you got into, Mark started designing these, what he called monster ghosts. And these monster ghosts are actually what turn into the hitchhiking ghosts. You can see the guy on the right is one of the hitchhiking ghosts at the end. Uh, but the guy second in from left, he's this kind of hunched over guy with a top hat. And from there, he designs two more to uh, monster ghosts with uh, top hats and gives them a hat box and says, oh, well, his head disappears with each beat of a heartbeat and appears in the hat box below. Uh, the one on the left is clearly the one they used for the design. And then this, uh, these are photos of uh, special effects genius Yale Gracie uh, doing uh, staging with the prototype Hatbox Ghost. And what was really cool, like in the last year and a half, uh, both, both of those heads in the photos have turned up. Uh, so the one at the top, that's the Hatbox Ghost um, test head. And I had no idea he had flaming red eyes. Um, and then that other uh, head down there, uh, that belongs uh, to, I believe, Yale Gracie's kids. Uh, so. Not Yale Gracie himself. No. Okay. No, thank God. Just to clear. <laughs> and uh, when you get into the final look of the Hatbox Ghost, as he was designed, uh, you can see, um, boy, they really nailed it. And especially, I love the gold tooth on him, but he's got this leering, creepy look to him. So this is definitely hewing more towards the cartoony ends of things, but I think he works really well. And uh, so for those of you who don't know, the Hatbox Ghost was only in the Haunted Mansion for a few weeks uh, early on. The gag didn't work. This is a really rare photo taken by a gentleman named Paul Clemens. He rode in the first couple weeks of the Haunted Mansion, and that's actually the Hatbox Ghost in the Haunted Mansion in probably 69. Um, you can see why the gag didn't work. You could see both heads at the same time. <laughs> uh, but regardless, they took it out, and that was really weird for me as a little kid uh, to have that record album and see a full page dedicated to the Hatbox Ghost, and I was like, I've never seen a Hatbox Ghost in there yeah. before. I'd, where did it go? But thankfully, uh, some, some of the geniuses at Walt Disney Imagineering, especially Daniel Joseph, actually figured out how to do the Hatbox Ghost gag right. So the Hatbox Ghost is back in there today when you ride the Haunted Mansion. And it's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of the attic... This is really interesting. This is one of the big, you know, people ask us, well, what did you discover in this book? This kind of this blew my head up when I discovered this. So this is, a, uh, this is a sketch Mark did for a ghost in the attic. And this is a ghost that is a see-through ghost where you can see through its body and you can see its heart and you can see its brain. And then you see these weird kind of ethereal twinkly lights running up and down the body. And uh, he took this drawing and he turned it into this next one. 
So again, um, this ghost is not the bride, although it would turn into the bride, but this ghost is a see-through ghost. And you can see she's not a bride, she's just holding a candlestick and you can see her heart and you can see her brain and she's got some weird twinkly lights and she's got a little ghost dog uh, next to her and you can see inside him as well. Uh, so as they went through production, they decided, okay, we're gonna get rid of the dog. So the dog got cut. And then they went ahead and made a maquette of her. And again, you can see she's not quite a bride yet. She's holding a candlestick and you can see her heart. She's kind of a specter wraith type figure with glowing eyes and uh, little twinkly lights that are supposed to be running up and down her body. Well, that's exactly how they built her. But right before they put her in the mansion, someone decided, we don't know who, to put a uh, bridal veil and a bouquet in her hands. And then she became the bride going back to the Ken Anderson version. So that's where the whole backstory of the bride comes from, just because someone at the last minute decided, let's make her a bride. And that's what's so fun about uh, unearthing all this stuff is you get to see the process. You know, you always think when you go on these rides or when you go to a movie, you think, oh, they must have just like thought of it all and did it. Yeah. Well, the process is very complex, a lot of twists and turns. And um, it's great to hear all the things. I'm sure, just like production on your films, right? Like how the, the different permutations of everything oh, yeah. you go through to. Yeah, hundreds. Yeah. Hmm. This is another really interesting one that I, I love. So this is, <laughs> this is great. This is a design Mark did called the Squeaky Door Ghost. And the idea was that she's adding squeaks uh, back yeah. to doors. <laughs> So I thought that, you know, oh, this is another one of Mark's great ideas that they never did. It never got realized. But lo and behold, while we were doing research on this book, um, we're looking at this photo of them doing staging for the Tiki Room. And I thought, what is that back there in the background? And when you lighten it up in Photoshop, they built a squeaky door ghost. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And then we found this photo of them sculpting it. So I think this is another Hatbox ghost situation. That's a lost ghost from the Haunted Mansion. I would love to put her back in. Mm. It'd be really cool. <laughs> yeah. So probably the most iconic stuff that Mark did in the Haunted Mansion would be the uh, changing portraits and the stretching uh, paintings. And uh, so here's Mark with uh, Walt Disney uh, showing his uh, Medusa changing portrait. And the way Mark originally designed the portrait gallery was a lot more menacing. You can see there are kind of weird thorny spikes coming out of the wall. And he described this as like going down into, into the belly of Jonah's whale. <laughs> a lot more menacing. Very big, too. And then if you look down at the end of the uh, portrait gallery, Mark designed these gates that are very strange that have big human hands on them. Uh, of course, they never built this in the Haunted Mansion that way, but Mark liked the design so much, he actually designed it as the entryway to his dining room. Yeah. <laughs> These are some rough sketches Mark did of some of the uh, changing portraits. Uh, one's Rasputin, which apparently Walt told him, you can't use Rasputin because some of his relatives might be, still be alive. Yeah, and be angry. So they didn't use Rasputin. <laughs> but they did do uh, Medusa turning into a Gorgon, which I, I love this sequence. And again, there are these beautiful watercolors that Mark did. He also did this uh, sequence of a ship going down to sea. I believe that's supposed to be the Flying Dutchman. And then this is a uh, panther lady, uh, which I love this one. So when it came time to actually build the portrait gallery in the Haunted Mansion, they actually didn't copy Mark's design at all other than the paintings. But the paintings are really the star of the room. They really are the focal point as you're, you're waiting to get on your doom buggy. I love this one too, the April through December one. It's really great. Oh, and then the, uh, this guy right here. So you may not know who this gentleman is. This gentleman is named Ed Cohn. And uh, Ed was hired by Mark to do the oil paintings of Mark's original designs. So when you go in the Haunted Mansion, you see it's a little different. It's the same idea, but done with more of a painterly oil type style. Uh, Alice told us she went to Chouinard with him. Mm. And uh, this is interesting. We, I, I'd heard that this idea came from Exitensio, I'm not sure, but Ed painted several other series of uh, changing portraits. And this is one that he did. Uh, it's this dust bowl taking over a Kansas farmhouse. So I don't think, I know they did a little test on this, but I don't think anyone's seen the original paintings that Ed did before. So I'm just gonna toggle through and give you a sense of what that might've looked like in the Haunted Mansion had they done it. I really love digging up some of these things that people haven't seen necessarily before and sharing them with everyone. It's always fascinating to yeah. me. 
This is another one where we get to track the evolution of yeah, stretching yeah. portraits. Super nerdy, but super fascinating to me. So uh, these are the stretching portraits by Mark, which of course are the most iconic part of the Haunted Mansion. So uh, this is really fun. Let's take a look at this next sequence of drawings and see what Mark's trying to come up with. So this is a stretching painting, and he's thinking, well, here's a lady, and she's, oh, she's, you know, kind of uh, on an old-fashioned bicycle, and, well, that's not that funny. What if we, um, we take her and we put her on a chair, and she's been scared by a mouse? Well, that's kind of funny, but I'm not so sure. What if we take a lady and let's give her a parasol, and maybe she's seeing her reflection somewhere? Well, it's not that funny, but I like the parasol, so maybe let's put her in danger. Let's put her on top of a building. Well, uh, that's not that funny. What if we really put her in danger, and let's put her on a tightrope uh, over an alligator who's about to get her? Yeah, I really like that idea. It's funny. Let's take that to a uh, hard pencil line drawing to really uh, flesh it out. And yeah, I like how that looks. And I'm going to take that into a watercolor. And that's the evolution of the uh, parasol group in the Haunted Mansion. Uh, yeah. So let's hear what Mark has to say about working on the stretching portraits. Mark, I want you to meet uh, Julie Reen. Mark you? Davis. Very nice to Julie you. is uh, Miss Disneyland Tencennial. And Mark Davis is the uh, master in charge of our house of illusions, or... Uh, uh, what do we call it? Uh, a haunted mansion. Haunted mansion and, uh, <laughs> and uh, supernatural. Oh, lots Can of supernatural. you give a little idea what to, <laughs> we're going to have in there? <laughs> yes, well, we're doing a lot of portraits that change right in front of your very eyes. As a matter of fact, one of our paintings here is based on Greek mythology. This is Medusa. It's a very beautiful girl. She offended the goddess Athena. And as a result, Athena turned her into a gorgon. And as you may know, if you looked at a gorgon, a gorgon would turn you into stone. Well, we sure don't want that to happen. What well, does uh, tell her about this thing here, will you mind? Well, this is our uh, <laughs> elongating stretching room. And in this room, we also have some stretching portraits. Perhaps you'd like to look at those over there. These are some of You pull them down, you should see what happens when the room gets longer, you get this full-size portrait. <laughs> this is my favorite here. Oh. Now, <laughs> oh, come on, let me get a picture here. Another picture right about there. That's it. Have you seen enough? You want to see some more? We got a lot of stuff. Oh, let's see some more. I Good. think we better get out of here. I think we're being watched, anyways. Good idea. <laughs> I love that. Walt is like clearly riffing. Yeah. <laughs> So that's our presentation. Thank you very much.